I'm really pleased to uh, introduce this session, which is part of um, the Digital Shift Forum uh, series. And this, this phase is entitled New Digital Frontiers, exploring the role of AI and machine learning uh, and the role that that plays in libraries, the platforms we use, um, the, the, the challenges that we face and the, the opportunities that we have. And this second event in, in this phase of the series will share some early reflections on prompt engineering in libraries. Now, I'm sure this is news to nobody who is, is listening. Um, the fact that generative AI tools um, have had quite a profound impact on um, universities and, and research libraries in, uh, in recent times. And the, uh, you know, the impact that they're having on the way people find information, carry out research, produce academic content, uh, and so forth, is bringing fundamental change to concepts such as authorship and plagiarism. Academic integrity is critically important in, in this space uh, and skills are crucial here too. Um, and librarians, other university staff and learners can adapt, take opportunities or may even be in risk, uh, may even, even be at risk of being left behind by the, the advent of, uh, of these tools. So at this point, I'm just going to introduce our, uh, our speakers who are both from the University of Essex. So um, Liam Bullingham uh, is joining us today uh, and Liam's role spans learning and teaching and research services. Uh, and accordingly, he leads a team at the University of Essex called Academic and Research Services. Um, he's worked in libraries at both teaching and research intensive universities and has been in the sector since starting as a graduate trainee at the University of Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, in 2008. Liam is a trustee of UKSG and co-organises the November conference, sits on the library advisory group for Open Research Europe and co-organises Open Research Week with colleagues in Liverpool and Lancashire and is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Um, joining Liam is Una Elinen and uh, she is of Finnish origin and is a, a creative writing graduate turned academic support librarian for postgraduate taught students at the University of Essex. Um, she's newly graduated from, U, uh, from UCL with an LIS master's and has worked across different library sectors since 2018. Her current work involves redesigning Essex's information literacy program to allow students to get credit for their library skills learning and enhancing the academic integrity and artificial intelligence support the university offers its students from undergrads to research students. So without further ado from me, uh, I'm going to hand over to Liam and Una um, to uh, talk more about prompt engineering in libraries. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks everyone for, for joining us, for your, for your time, for your attention. Um, I'm really glad you're here and we get the chance to talk about this because um, there's a few enthusiasts here at Essex and we like to talk about this stuff, but being able to do it more, more widely um, is great and I'd love to hear your ideas and thoughts. So please, please throw everything into the chats and let's see, see what we get. Um, one reason I'm be particularly pleased to be doing this session is that we get to get specific about AI. We're not just talking about, talking about AI and libraries now, we're actually going to a particular facet or a particular area of interest. Um, so that's, I think that's that makes the session, if not fully novel, uh, it's got a particular interest to it. Okay, so let's introduce ourselves. Um, I'll start with myself and then if I could ask Una to introduce herself and also speak on behalf of Beth as well, that'd be great. So yes, um, Tom's given me a proper introduction already, um, but yeah, I work as an assistant director uh, in library and cultural services at Essex. And my interest, my, my kind of area is strategy, kind of some of the opportunities that um, prompt engineering is going to present for us and enabling transitions, you know, and, and skilling up the staff um, to be able to to work with this effectively as well. So, um, and I'll just, before Una introduce herself, I'll just say, I, I think it's really good to work as teams on this stuff and to to think in terms of teams. We work in very different roles, very different levels. And I think that is part of the strength we have here. Okay, Una, please go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm Una and yeah, I'm our academic support librarian for postgraduate talk students, which has really been the focus of um, our information literacy teaching is making sure that the support that we offer doesn't just encompass our undergraduate students, but making sure that postgrads who may come from international or different educational backgrounds um, also get the support that they need. And that's really been the focus of, of my role and how I got involved in all of this sort of AI and learning about AI and how, how our students use it and how we can make sure that 
both staff and students have an understanding of, of how these tools work and how we can support them um, and how libraries really bring something to the table in that. Um, and we have just finished our information literacy program revamp um, that has consisted everything of all of our online resources, all of our workshops um, and everything that we deliver and offer to our students. We've, we've just redesigned everything and we're delivering it for the first time these this week and next week, actually. Uh, so it's a very exciting time time for us. Uh, and we are missing Beth, who is unwell today, who is from our content delivery team. So she's more from the side of resource acquisition, looking at how AI could help us with workflows and processes and how it can help us automate tasks so that we can focus on the more creative and more interesting tasks. And AI could help us sort of automate the more labor intensive manual, very repetitive tasks that don't necessarily require someone to sit there and you know, sift to a spreadsheet, for example. So I think that's where, where best focus has really been, is looking at processes and workflows. Great, thank you, Una. Okay, so in this session, what we'll be covering, um, we'll of course start with a, a definition, just share how we understand prompt engineering. Um, we'll be looking at some early models, or I suppose you could call them resources that are emerging, and how we're thinking about applying them. And at this point, I will say we, we are not experts in this area. We are thinking about it. We'll work into our practice, but we are very much at the learning stage. And then we'll move on to terminology. Uh, there are, again, it's a bit of a jungle in terms of the terms, and Una will explain um, how we can maybe unpick that and understand that in a, in a better way uh, rather than some of the novel terms that are flying around. And also then we'll think about in terms of how we integrate um, prompt engineering and related skill sets in terms of processes, workflows, also teaching. And then you know, we'll be talking about prompt libraries with us as well as a resource. And we'll be finishing off by reflecting on skills development and training opportunities. So that's what we're covering. Okay, so let's start with our definition. Well, um, it's usually useful to take um, a definition from you know, a key source, uh, a respected um, organization or person. So the one I find personally useful is from IBM. And they talk about how um, prompt engineering helps generative AI models better comprehend and respond to a wide range of queries and from the simple to the highly technical. So in other words, prompts are not always simple, natural language. They can get very technical and they're going to be the kind of things that are maybe beyond some of us. Um, and IBM continues by noting that the basic rule that good prompts equals good results. So I suppose that's a variation of the old adage of rubbish in, rubbish out uh, from computer science. So that is um, relevant and pertinent here. But uh, these, this first section is Beth's section. And so I'm going to be talking to them. Um, and what Beth wanted to highlight was about um, how she sees prompt engineering. Um, and she, she thinks of it in terms of forming questions or instructions for these models. Um, so large language models, for example. And I should note, we'll be talking about we're probably talking about prompt engineering in terms of, of text um, rather than in images or other kinds of prompts. So that's just a bit of context. Um, and you know, she often thinks about improving her knowledge or improving those outputs by editing the prompts she used to retrieve um, accurate or more specific information. And you know, it's not just about what you enter into that box. It's also about understanding the model you're working with, a large language model, um, and what it can and can't do, and working around that and working with the system um, and how that shapes um, the, the kind of prompting that you do and the kind of information retrieval um, that we're hoping to get back. And no one, no one size fits all is a, is a point she really wants to emphasize. Um, so the, the, you know, the need to be flexibility, not, not rigid in our approach is key. And also, Although some of the things we're going to say are going to be about following principles, um, Beth really wanted to stress that you, you need to be creative. It's not just trying and retrying things, but it's maybe approaching things in the left field way or in a way that um, you might not be accustomed to um, when you're um, entering some of the prompts. And I will give you a nice little example of that later on. Okay, so this is um, a, a quote she wanted to pick out, and it's, 
again, you'll see a lot of metaphors when you talk about prompt engineering. We'll be talking about recipes and, and or cooking, and that's that's kind of a, a relevant context that helps us understand some of this stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's talking about you know sauce from a jar is fine, but you know when you when you do it yourself more, when you cook yourself and start with the raw ingredients, you're expecting a different result, expecting something better. So um, yeah, this is a, an analogy that's been raised by McKinsey & Company. Okay, so let's look at some, some models that um, I and Una have been thinking about. And we'll also be looking at a few mnemonics um, and things that you can integrate into your teaching um, towards the end as well under skills and training. But we'll start with these ones. So, um, so Neil Ramachan, he's um, got this really helpful resource I found um, useful for getting uh, getting some of the basics down with prompt engineering, and um, the website is um, there's a lot, there's a lot of good free content on there, and um, he produces this structure of a prompt. So he thinks it in terms of you know the components, which is what he calls the thirty thousand feet high level understanding of it. And so this is before we even know what kind of prompts we're putting in. Is it is it text? Are we using an image? You know, and he talks about how in the future prompts, well, we have voice prompts now already. That's a feature of um, ChatGPT, but eventually there could be things like gesture as well. So people could be prompting using British Sign Language, for example, um, or you could be when you're when you're using voice, your your hand gestures, your enthusiasm that might even enrich the kind of prompt. So it's it's very interesting how he sees the future of, of prompt engineering. But in terms of the components, it's like the um, the considerations for kind of what you want to get out uh, before you even come to start to compose it. And so specific instructions you might want to put in, or you know the way you, the way you're going to shape your input. Uh, what's what's included, what's excluded in terms of parameters, and you know, is there a specific task? Because there can be multiple different kinds of prompts um, which can be grouped. And then as we move on to to elements, this is kind of starting to think towards ingredients. So he talks about temperature in terms of the kind of output you might want in terms of you know how how creative the language might be. Um, the audience as well is, is a key consideration. You know, what, what this output? Who's this output for? Um, you know, are we using seed images? Are we using documents? Um, particular commands or queries? Things to, to squeeze in and feature in. Um, and so we're getting towards more specifics. And then the recipes is really kind of the elements of all of the above so far. You know, what based on all that early consideration of those first two sections. You know, what. What features in what is what is listed, and that starts to um, form the the prompt instance and you know, the actual how the prompt um, what resembles how long it is, how thorough it is, how specific it is. So all these kind of considerations you, lead you to um, to a prompt in this in this process. That kind of is different to perhaps how people every day are prompting. Um, tools such as ChatGPT, where they are, they're just asking questions, they're going for a, a kind of conversation. And I suppose uh, someone here would want to maybe differentiate in terms of an information retrieval or maybe a library professional kind of context, how that is different to how you might just casually chat to, um, to something like ChatGPT. So that's a, a structure that's offered for us there. Um, there was a recent paper. It's just in preprint stage, I should note. So it's not being peer reviewed. So um, yeah, the eventual paper could be could very well be different. But um, got to champion open science and um, be able to our ability to be able to access this stuff, uh, this research is earlier is really really useful for practitioners, such as myself. Um, and this is um, by Bashar Tatel and. Um, the, the, the paper's called Principal Instructions, All You Need for Questioning Llama and GPT. And um, also note that this is from a university which specializes in AI um, over in near Abu Dhabi, which is you know particularly interesting because I, I didn't know such an institution existed. But they present 26 principles, so kind of 26 things to consider when you, know, you want to produce good quote um, prompts, which is a lot to take on board. Um, so I'm not going to cover all of them because we would need a much longer session. But I'm going to pick out a few which really stood out to me in this uh, preprint paper. So the second of the 26 um, is talking about you know, the need to integrate who the intended audience is um, to get high quality outputs. Um, and so you know, 
for example, saying, you know, this, what I want back, you know, this is for an expert audience. So you might say, you know, you're a, you're an academic librarian or an information professional, or there may be something that we don't really understand so well and we want it simplified. So you might have heard people, um, you might have heard of examples where people say, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old and um, then it gets back um, something much, much more accessible. Um, or, and this can be adjusted and the benefit really of is information accessibility in terms of us being able to access and work with material that perhaps would have been too technical for us. So these are these are some of the considerations there. Um, the the, sec the second one in this table, um, principle number 10, is quite controversial, I think. They, they advocate for the purposes of good information retrieval, basically threatening punishment, which I found that quite astounding. So in order to get things back, um, they the researchers have found that large language models produce more desired or better information if you threaten it. So you will be penalized um, if you don't give me a good answer to this is, you know, one of the things that they, they recommend putting in prompts in particular um, circumstances, which I've, I fact this is mind boggling to me because if we take this on board and start recommending it to our students, our researchers to, to threaten large language models, how does that sit with our wider professional morals and practices? Um, obviously you don't want it to be spilling out in the way we communicate with other humans whoever they are so all kinds of things and um, considerations there i suppose the question is how far would we go for the purposes of information retrieval and another principle which i have featured here talks about you know offering a tip to the uh, the llm you know i'll tip you 300 dollars if you tell me about this and yeah really really interesting um that some of these things seem to be working from the researcher's point of view um, the third on the table talks about you know using particular phrases, and you might see lots of tips about this you know, from from various commentators saying, "Oh, enter this phrase, you get better stuff back." Like, uh, for example, if you're trying to get a good image, there's a LinkedIn Learning uh, course which talks about you know using the phrase "digital art" at the end of your prompt, and that somehow works better. So this one, uh, they're talking about ensuring your answer is unbiased and avoids relying on stereotypes which is really good when the um, LLM is pulling from the wider web um, because lots of content on the web is, you know, is based on, on stereotypes and, and, and all various kinds of sources. So trying to rein that in for the sake of quality makes a lot of sense. And then finally, um, the one I just want to pick out is um, stating the requirements that the model must follow, produce content. You know, what, what do you want your output to look like? That's what this last row is talking about. So if you're trying to get it to help you with some literature searching or maybe a systematic review, you know, give me some keywords around this. Uh, this is my research question. This is what I'm researching. I want a list of keywords uh, based on this. And then that can help you evaluate your search strategy or help build it up. Um, but it doesn't have to be keywords. It could be regulations, instructions, as, as we've seen here. And the researchers I find also useful is in their paper, they they categorize the the, the twenty six. So there's there's five different categories. Um, obviously, I'm just showing three different ones here, but I find it really really useful as a comprehensive look at the the art of prompt engineering, as where we are right now. It's it's a useful paper. Okay, so I've given you a couple of examples there about structure of a prompt and also this paper, which is trying to gather everything together in terms of principles. Um, I thought let's try some of it in practice um, and using it with a, a library tool that you know, will all, you know, certain members of library staff will start to need to be really good at prompt engineering to help you know, use the tool to its fullest um, in the way now that we can build search strategies and keywords and be on top of things like Boolean operators. It's the same idea here. We'll be using prompt engineering to maximize outputs from uh, from library databases. One such resource we have at the University of Essex is Statista. And you may have noticed that Statista now has uh, a new way to engage with its platform, which is called, they're calling Research AI. And you'll see the tagline is from prompt to insight in 30 seconds. So if you if you have subscriptions to Statista and haven't yet played around with this, I would I would recommend it. They they do give you some some preset recipes to kind of help you um, immediately pull back some good results, but obviously you'll want to customize them to your own individual research needs. 
So um, don't have masses of time now, but one thing I was I started off by doing was just asking Statista about something I know about. So I said, oh, tell me about the academic publishing industry. How has it changed over the last five years? And for my initial prompt, I stopped at that point. And, that, and it gave me back you know, a reasonable answer, a bit light on actual statistical sources. But um, what this tool does, it takes the, the 10 best examples from the Statista database and it, it feeds those back in and they shape the answer. So this is an example of a RAG system, uh, which is retrieval augmented generation. And the idea with, with RAG is that you get um, you get better results because the um, the large language model is is anchored to an external information source, um, and you know all the the high quality data within that. So this is it's using the functionality of the uh, the large language model underneath, but it's drawing from the database of knowledge from Statista. Interestingly, they started off with Chat GPT four Turbo. And now the model underneath is Claude 3 Sonnet, which I hear is quite a conversational one. So maybe they're thinking that's how people are going to interact with the, the results. So anyway, yeah, I I try to apply some of the principles in my prompts. So I said, you know, don't talk about book publishing because my initial answer got a lot about that. And I was more interested in journal articles. Um, and I also said who I am and um, the kind of the information I want to work with, you know, um, as I'm the audience. Um, and my fam familiarity with the industry. Um, I said, you know, how long I wanted the response to be because I didn't want to read an essay. Um, so I just wanted the three paragraph response. Um, you can't see all of that, but it did give me the three paragraphs. And I wanted something I could quote during this webinar. So I was giving it some context. And then, yeah, I, I took that line about being unbiased and relying on stereotypes. In hindsight, that's not the best with a RAG system or such as this one, because a lot of the content in Statista doesn't rely on stereotypes. It's more in depth. So that's something I could instantly have scored out. Um, so this is what Beth was talking about with you know, being creative and, and being flexible based on the context. So, yeah. And then I said I wanted the, you know, the key stats in a table format. And it didn't give me that, which was interesting. Um, and then I also said, yeah, ask me any questions before you answer. So in other words, is there things it could follow up with to give me a better response? And again, it didn't do that either. So as I say, I'm still quite early in my learning journey with prompt engineering. So maybe I made some mistakes here, but um, what it did produce was a, fair, a fairly useful um, uh, response and output, and it was better than this that initial one sentence prompt. Um, but you can see here there's a quality alert flashed up. So in other words, Statista is not sure that the, you know, the the quality of the response was good enough. So this is where the back and forth comes in, where I need to kind of refine that, maybe simplify my prompt and then build up again. Um, again, a bit like searching a database when you we get zero results, you've obviously gone too narrow and you need to broaden it out. So um, that is an example in practice. And I would argue that, you know, subject librarians are equivalent um, as new databases come onto the market and we start, in, they form part of our subscriptions. We'll need to obviously know how to use them. And that means we'll need to know how to prompt effectively. Okay, I'm gonna pass it over to Una for terminology. Awesome. Yeah, I think we can maybe just start with talking about some different types of prompts. So that leads on quite nicely from, um, Liam talking about Statista and some of the things that he was doing with his prompt. Um, so what we can see there is that potentially the model um, underlying this, this, this AI doesn't allow for kind of follow up prompts or these the sort of um, extras, you know, like ask me questions before you answer, because some of the, the large language models out there, they will respond to those questions and they will produce tables, but not all of them do. And sometimes you have to ask in a very specific way. Um, but there's lots of different approaches to prompting. And what I found when I've been sort of looking into this and trying to find different strategies for prompting because this, this term prompt engineering has kind of been thrown around, but no one's really been able to define it quite neatly or what that means or what that entails or how you can learn about it. It's just kind of emerged out of nowhere. And as someone pointed out in the chat that it does bear a lot of resemblance to traditional information retrieval and research skills. So we can definitely see some overlap in some of these types of prompting strategies and with information retrieval or with research methods. So you might recognize some of these and kind of go, oh, this sounds awfully familiar. And what I've picked out here is a couple of the more common ones that I've seen around and that I think kind of summarize some of the other um, versions of these. So I've seen, for example, chain of thought prompting. I've seen that called about four or five different names for what I think essentially boils down 
to what is chain of thought prompting. So some people call it iterative prompting, um, adaptive prompting and something else as well. So it's basically they all do the same thing and they all boil down to the same principle, but have different names. And that feels sometimes a little bit like a complicating something that should be quite simple or that I think should be open and accessible to everybody. But here we have some examples. So I'll just talk through the ones on the slide. And then um, if anybody does have any questions about those, feel free to drop them in the Q&A or pop them in the chat and see if you notice any resemblances to sort of more traditional library skills. Um, but we start with system message prompting. So this is where you basically give the tool a persona or a function, and that kind of limits the perspectives that you will approach a task from. So you wouldn't do necessarily any other kind of limiting of the prompt. You'd say you are an academic researcher, give me a list of keywords, for example. So you just limit it by telling it's an academic researcher um, and then you ask your, your normal question. And you might see that there's a slight difference between if you just asked it for a list of keywords, because then it approaches it slightly more from an academic or a, a research perspective and might give you to um, the kinds of keywords that you would actually use in a database search rather than generic synonyms for what you're um, on your topic. We've got a zero shot prompting, and this is probably the most common one that people use where you don't give the tool any examples necessarily. You build the context that it needs or you think it needs into your original prompt. You just ask your question and you get an answer and that's it. Um, and it's a very kind of short back and forth in that way. You ask one question, you get one answer and that's it. Um, and that is really effective for some really simple things or where you think you can build the context into your original prompt. You might have to do a slightly longer prompt to be able to give it all that extra information. Like um, Liam's one, for example, um, is a is a is an example of a zero shot prompt where you give all the context and the examples it needs in the original prompt. Whereas then you've got few shot prompting where you might ask it a few questions first before you build up to the kind of ultimate task that you're trying to get it to do is first you tell it that you're writing a dissertation on a, on a topic and what your research questions are and what your methods are. You ask it to maybe critique your, your um, idea or your argument and what other things you might want to think about, how you might want to collect your data and so forth. Then you ask it for how you might want to uh, structure your dissertation, what sort of chapters you might want or what sort of time you might take for each task. And eventually you ask it for a project plan. And that way you kind of give it a few examples, let it build up to the task that you're trying to do rather than build, building it all into to one prompt. So you give it a few examples first and then build up. And these are the ones that you can see kind of thrown around a lot more. Then we've got chain of thought prompting, and this is probably what most people end up doing without really realizing that they do, where you start with just one idea and based on what the tool responds, you then shape your further prompts based on that response. So you might ask it, what do you think about this idea for a paper? And it tells you what it, what it thinks are the strengths and the weaknesses of that prompt. And then you kind of pick out from that what you think is important or what you think is interesting and ask it to expand. I end up having a almost like a conversation with one of these tools, one of these tools. So it's a lot less structured and almost resembles like a semi-structured interview where you have a starting point, but then you see where the conversation leads you. Um, and you might have some sort of initial ideas of what you want to get out of that conversation, but you don't necessarily know how exactly you're going to get there. And this is where you kind of go in with a lot less structure and a lot less context and you just see where the tool takes you. I've also seen this called tree of thought prompting, where you have a you start from one idea and then you branch out into a couple of different um, directions, and then you take each of those directions and expand on those until you get to like the the end product, almost like the leaves um, among those branches, where you get to these end end points that then don't go any further. And then we've got context expansion. This one I've seen around a lot less, but this is quite good for just brainstorming. Um, and seems to be the approach that people take when they don't quite know what they're doing yet or what they want out of the tool yet, where you just start from an idea and ask it to identify the five W's and a how to build on your original premise. You can ask it to either ask those questions from you um, or where you can um, get it to answer questions for your, for yourself, where you get um, you ask those questions and it responds to you. Uh, then we've got the uh, be in your toast prompting. So this was coined by... Um, Lance Elliott, who writes for, for mainly Forbes, I think he writes, is a, an AI and machine learning specialist. And this is a kind of similar idea to that you will be penalized or I will tip you $300, where you kind of tell the tool to be on its toes um, and look for ulterior motives, where before it answers your query and what um, people have seemed to have found, and I've tested this myself as well, I find that it does give a lot more critical, more analytical responses, and it does tend to kind of question what you're actually trying to get out of the um out of the question itself. So it's not enough to just kind of tell it to look for ulterior motives because then you usually know that you're kind of testing it. Whereas if you also tell it to kind of be on your toes, be on your guard, look out for 
um, for kind of something sinister almost, you can get it to analyze a little more of what it's responding and you seem to get a lot more relevant, a lot more helpful, a lot more correct responses as well because you almost build in that initial check because sometimes what you have to do with these tools, you get an answer and then you go back and you ask, is that quite right? Are you sure about that? Um, and this is the sort of thing that seems to get rid of having to do that step where you build in that sense of urgency, that sense of there's something else going on here, um, where if you just tell it to be on its toes and look for those kind of ulterior motives uh, before it answers your query. And you may see some of these kind of thrown around and you may see people saying that, you know, they're an expert in prompt, engineer, prompt engineering and they can provide you with a prompt cheat sheet and that sort of thing. We'll talk about prompt libraries a little bit later on. Um, but I think there's a lot of terminology that gets thrown around and I do feel like that is contributing to this sense of almost mystifying or making prompting really difficult or really complicated. So if we move on to the next slide, I think I have some thoughts on there about, about that. Um, and maybe so either some of that, you can always start to see that kind of link to, to more traditional um, research methods. So we mentioned uh, chain of thought being quite similar to semi-structured interviews or where you might see context expansion building into almost like a questionnaire that you could use where you think about your audience and what you're trying to do and when you're doing it and why you're doing it. Um, and with these prompting strategies, I think what we are seeing is this kind of making things more complicated than it needs to be, making it seem like it's a technical skill that you need to have a lot of digital skills, you need to spend a lot of time with these tools, you need to have an understanding of how they work. Not necessarily, you just have to have a rough idea of how how these tools work, but you don't need to understand the technical coding side of things behind them. You don't need to necessarily understand machine learning to be able to use a tool like this. And I think that is pushing um, skills like prompt engineering towards um, like a monetization of information retrieval, where we see people offering, oh, I will for nine nine ninety nine, you can buy 50 prompts. Um, or you can buy access to a subscription database that has prompts, you know, that sort of thing where we almost see like, oh, this is too complicated for you. You won't be able to do this by yourself. You need to buy access to it or you need to buy access to a premium tool or you need to um, get help from an expert, which I don't think that's necessarily true. I, I believe that prompt engineering is, is simply just another digital skill that you can learn. And that if you have the kind of associated information literacy skills, if you have a basic understanding of how to search for information, how to reference it, how to evaluate it, you will be perfectly fine with AI tools and it doesn't need to be complicated. And a lot of times it's just a question of, of experimenting and spending a little bit of time with these tools. Cool, I think that's pretty much everything I had on that. We move on to processes then. Yeah, let's let's do that. I notice we're um we're quite well into the the hour now, so I'll maybe be a bit fast with this one, which just as well because it's Beth's slides. Um, but before I was going to bring in Beth's content, I was going to um, mention just a really interesting conversation I had yesterday. I'm going to do a name drop. I was talking to Charlie Rappel, whose um company uh, Kudos they provide um, summaries of research papers which are very accessible and they're for a general audience. Really good like layman summaries. And she was talking about how they've been using um, AI tools to to generate um, uh, these these summaries, which you know, rather than asking the researchers, the authors themselves, to produce them, and to get good results, they've they've had to get good with prompt engineering. Um, but as Una said, they already had you know ten years experience of knowing what a good summary looks like and understanding you know the, the desired output. So that that would like constructively help them with picking up prompt engineering quite quickly. Um, so yeah, I, if you want to know a bit more about the kudos example, um, then there's a, there's a blog post there I'm pointing to, but it's a potential opportunity or an area libraries might work into in the future if we want to make our research repositories more accessible. And instead of providing an academic abstract on the front uh, page of um, you know an output in a, a research repository, we might, if we decide to provide layman summary, we could be using AI tools and be prompting them to give us good summaries. So, there's, it, it might you know this might open up, open up new new models or new new things where we can add value in libraries. 
Um, but yeah, so best content was really what she wanted to talk about was integrating into kind of everyday processes and workflows. And that's something she's thinking about. Just as a reminder, she works on our collections and content side of um, library and cultural services. So the question she's asking is, you know, can AI, in, more general than just prompt engineer, can it help us automate more menial tasks? And we can focus on creative projects or, you know, skilling up customer service. And how can it prompt engineer in particular how can we fit that into what we do? How can we make do things faster with prompt engineering, or can can we um, enhance the quality? So um, yeah, these are some some thoughts from Beth. Um, and yeah, you know, in terms of getting answers to questions, there is, you know, um, she you know she works with reading this, so she she raised this example of um, you know the checks you kind of do associated with reading this. Can we do prompts to you know check on mass? Um, and enhancing mark records as well. Um, if anyone's familiar with like, cataloging standards, um, is one way you know you could do that. And um, having it as a process to you know smooth out existing workflows, which I think is an interesting concept. So these are some of the questions that Beth is asking in her day-to-day -day role. So she gives an example here. So where you've got a resource need, um, maybe highlighted by your academics, you're finding your supplier, and you know, then you'll be ordering it and adding it to the catalog. And she's thinking you know, along that flow, is there ways where you know prompts can help us streamline or improve the quality of our resources? Okay. This is me. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I think there were a couple of questions again in the chat about sort of getting students to care about this or Kind of demystifying it again making sure that they're not just relying on what they're finding or what they can pay for out um out online or thinking it's like google what we've done with our skills at library program so this is our information literacy program and we run workshops throughout the year as part of that um where we deliver just general information literacy skills all the way from how to use the library to um finding full text to their search skills, their evaluation skills, referencing all the way down to making information accessible and inclusive. And we've what we've done with AI is we've broken it down and integrated something of AI into everything that we deliver to show that it's not just a buzzword, it's not just a thing that they, they can come to a one hour workshop on AI and just be done with it and never have to either think about it again or now they can just go and do whatever they want with it. It's a kind of reminder that there's lots of other things out there as well. There's lots of skills that go into using AI. So what we have in, for example, in our, we have an organizing session where we talk about how they can get organized for their study and their research. And we talk about AI tools that help with brainstorming or finding action items out of a brain dump, um, how to use tools like Notion or Trello that have AI elements. Then in our advanced literature searching sessions, what we talk about is AI tools for searching, tools like Elicit or Research Rabbit, where they can do citation chaining or where they can do literature searching and they can use um, those tools to extract data or where they can summarize their readings in an AI tool, how they can use those tools in ways that are ethical and helpful and aren't just focused on prompt engineering. Um, but we do also have an introduction to prompt engineering session and that's seen quite a good attendance and that Originally, what I ran was a kind of combination of the two where we first talked about um, prompt engineering, and then we talk about all the other AI tools out there. But now we've broken down the other AI tools into the other content that we deliver and just talk, talk about prompt engineering. And that's where we kind of highlight how those skills that they learn from the other sessions, the other workshops, come in to prompt engineering and how they still need to understand how these processes work in order to really get the most out of, of generative AI um and how they still need to consider things like biases and accessibility of ai generated content so we talk a lot about the ethics and how they can reference their ai use and how it's not the same as a lot of other um software and tools and and um kind of applications that are out there so it's not just google you need a lot more thinking into it but it's still a commercial product a lot of these tools or some of them might still have biases they might have gaps they might have errors and what I usually do with that session is I start with demoing how tools like ChatGPT get things wrong, um, how they can make errors and how you might end up with gaps or how you might end up with something that isn't very helpful. And that usually kind of makes them have this like little light bulb moment where they go, oh, I can't just trust it blindly. I have to actually go and evaluate it. And then usually the next question is, well, how do I evaluate it? 
And then what we do is we show them how to write a prompt, a better prompt um, that en ensures they kind of reduce those hallucinations, reduce misinformation, and it might not um, eliminate them entirely, but it gives them something that is a little bit better and a little bit more relevant to what they want. Because the more you get something relevant, the more they'll know that they'll have the skills already to know that this is what I like, like you were saying, but the kudos example is they already knew what a good summary looks like. So they, if they are, if they spend any time with their subject, they'll already know some things. They just need to put it into words. And that's the difficult thing for a lot of students. A lot of times the misuse of AI, it doesn't really come from a malicious place. It comes from an, a place of ignorance or a place of fear of other academic skills like writing or referencing. And they're trying to find the easier way to do it, not because they're trying to skip out of the work, but because they don't know how to do the work itself. So if we can teach them the associated skills, hopefully the AI can just be a kind of complementary or something that can enhance their process and not something that replaces it entirely. But I think when we teach AI and when we talk about AI and learning, I think there's some questions here at the bottom of the slides about what I think is important when we do talk about AI and when we integrate AI into our content is what are the messages that we do want to send to our users? Are we telling them they can't, that they can't use it because it's scary and it's terrifying and nobody really knows how it works? No, probably not. I think what we want to say to them is experiment, learn how it works, learn how to use it well, learn how to use it ethically. And that's going to serve you much better and much longer than just refusing to pretend, acting like it doesn't exist or being scared of it. What skills do we want them to learn? There's a lot of things that AI can do that we can use in teaching. And I think we have an example in the next slide about um, an AI um, task um, or how we could use AI. So this is from the JISC materials on assessment ideas for um, for integrating AI. So this is an example of um, students going and kind of designing their own prompt. So that gets rid of them using AI to write something because what they're actually doing is using and utilizing the AI in their answer. But it still allows them to, to demonstrate skills that we think are important for them to learn things like critical evaluation, solving problems, you know, digital skills, which AI literacy really comes under. So for example, in this case, it would be prompt engineering for them having to go and write a prompt, but they also need to reflect because they need to reflect on is this prompt good? What was good about it? What was bad about it? How were the different variations in their prompts? Um, what was good about them? What was bad about them? How they changed their prompt to make it better um, and what they kind of brought into that. So this here's just one example of how you might be able to use AI in teaching. And this is kind of what we really do in the prompt engineering session that I run is that we take a couple of the different examples and the, the prompting strategies that we showed earlier and talked about earlier, and we try them and we show them, this is how it, your answer gets better if you use these skills, if you use these principles, if you follow these mnemonics. Um, and that usually already gives them an idea of why they need to care about that and why they can't just skip a corner and get a prompt library subscription and just use a prompt that they find. Um, but one of the big questions that we do get is, are these prompts going to be in the slides? Yes, they will be. But what they usually get out of that is that they also get the comparison. Is this is the original and this is the better one. And out of that, they start to see how and why the, the kind of second prompt is, is better. Awesome. Prompt libraries, yes, just mentioned. Um, so this is an idea that I've been playing around with for a while and still haven't managed to really get started with something kind of humming and hurrying about the pros and cons of this and the potential approach to this and just purely the amount of work that would go into doing this. But this is something that I think we've seen pop up um, now that generative AI has kind of anchored itself in um, academic skills and generally in, in the kind of wider population. But this is an idea that we've been talking about as a potential to combat the fact that not everybody can afford all the kind of premium AI tools. There was a, a webinar a while ago um, that talked about how much it costs if you subscribe to all of the AI tools that do all the things that we think students would need. And there's something like hundreds of pounds a month that you would end up spending on if you got the kind of full suite of AI tools. And this could be something that could potentially help with that is that if we offered something as an institution that students can get access to, um, that would give them prompts for specific tasks. So it could be grouped by, by the type of task that they're trying to do, finding keywords, designing a search strategy, project planning, um, almost anything, proofreading, proofreading is a really big one. And that's usually the one that makes students go, oh, I like that. Because um, AI is quite good at proofreading. It's really good at picking up typos. And if it doesn't pick up the context, if it kind of gets confused about a sentence, then a probably a reader would too. 
So there's lots of things that AI can can do and is really good at, and that doesn't veer so much into the whole kind of it producing original original um, content in that way that would reproduce biases or contain kind of misinformation because all you're asking it really to do is create a table for a project plan. Um, and we could get students in as collaborators. They could tell us what they want, what, what prompts they've used, what they found is helpful. So that might take some of the the kind of workload off of us if we got students to actually populate this and it would almost be like a peer-to-peer -peer, um, sharing that is just moderated by staff. Um, it would maybe allow us to do some more subject specific things. Maybe we've got students who, you know, I'm a, as, as it was um, said in the introduction, I'm an English lit and creative writing grad. So I've come from that sort of background. So if someone comes and asks me for prompts on coding and data analysis, I won't be able to help. So the prompt library would prompt library would be really reliant on the people upholding it and having backgrounds in all sorts of different areas. Whereas if we had students populating it, we might be able to get some more subject specific things in. Um, and in that sense, it would be nice for this to be like a live database rather than a static document. Because what I do also find is that every now and again, when there's an update to a model, you know, ChatGPT 4.0, I think it is, that just came out, that's changed how certain prompts work or how good it is at picking up certain things. So now you can make slightly more complicated prompts so you don't have to be quite so elaborate about what you say because it's really slightly more powerful. So it's good at picking up um, context that it wasn't in before. Um, but now some of the prompts that used to work don't work anymore because of changes in models and changes in, um, in how these tools work. So in that sense, a static document is never gonna be as efficient as a live database, but again, who's gonna uphold it, who's gonna maintain it and, and all that sort of, sort of issue. So we've got next slide that where we talk about pros and cons. Uh, cons. So we've already mentioned some of these, but I do think that there is a, a kind of concern with digital skills and um, especially with financial implications on, on some students getting access to all these tools or not everybody being able to, to afford or access all these tools. And also just this this kind of lack of confidence with with associated academic skills or academic English writing skills that international students or students from kind of different educational backgrounds might struggle with and of offering them something that we've written can help with that and can help even up the playing field a little bit in that way. And it might also give us just a better idea of what we consider acceptable use or this kind of reduce the misuse that might come from, from ignorance of, oh, well, it's there. So I just went and wrote something in it. Whereas if we have a prompt library and we say you can only use prompts from this library and anything outside of that wouldn't be allowed, it would maybe give us a bit of control over what's considered acceptable use or maybe weed out some of that. Oh, I just went and did it because I was able to. Um, but the cons is there is quite a bit of potential there for misuse. You might give them a prompt for one thing and they adapt it just a tiny bit and now they're able to do something that maybe they shouldn't be doing, you know, copying and pasting or using it to write their essay or getting it to edit um edit their work in a kind of significant way rather than just proofreading um does require a lot of monitoring a lot of updating especially if we've got students to put things in so we need to make sure that all those things are appropriate for other students to use it's time and resources that we might not have available um and i think that would typically also end up pushing us more towards using these zero shot prompts where you don't get a lot of examples because it'd have to be the so customizable but you can't really have a chain of thought prompt um because the whole idea of that is that you start from one thing and you let the AI lead you somewhere or you have a conversation with it. So you'd really be looking at mainly zero shots where you just kind of put in a prompt, you get a response and that's it. You wouldn't really be able to do much of the more customized um, prompting strategies. And I think there is a real potential there that it might re remove that incentive to go and learn the digital skills that students need to actually use these tools effectively, which might be doing them a disservice by offering them something that almost takes away the work of them having to go and use AI. But I think there's there's definitely two approaches there. And we might have to just try it and see what happens because so far we've just kind of thought about it and talked about it, but we haven't really seen it seen it go. Um, so it might be something that we just need to try. Absolutely. Um, could you just give us, because we want to finish, we give, give five minutes for questions. Could you just give us the top lines with skills of development? And sorry for going on too much earlier on, not giving you <laughs> enough time. <laughs> yeah, you're okay. Um, so I think what we have here is is about what is actually a good prompt and how you could go and learn prompt writing and what you need to cover when you're writing a prompt, what does a good output look like and how you could spot errors or hallucinations and how you can write prompts that reduce these. So in the next one we talk about, we've got a couple of different mnemonics that we've pulled out. So this is a LinkedIn learning course. Um, it's the 
we've got our credit link there. The name of the session is, is how to research and write using generative AI tools. Um, and the person running this uh, brings out this create mnemonic where um, you kind of give it a persona, a character, you give it a very specific request. So this is what you want the tool to achieve. You can give it examples. And then there's a good reminder here about adjustments of so being adaptive and remembering to to edit and that if you're not getting anywhere with one approach or one prompt that you might have to just try an entirely different approach um, or you might want to just go and start from the beginning edit your prompts and that sort of thing you know, type of output chat gpt especially famous for bullet points um, so i think we're seeing what you could also do is do things like tables or telling it very specifically how many examples you want how many words and so forth and then you've got the extras ask me questions before you answer is probably my personal favorite one because that it it gives you that chance to give the extra context that you didn't uh, necessarily know to put into your original prompt or that you don't necessarily know that the tool needs at once. Whereas in the next one, um, we've got some general, um, another, another mnemonic, mnemonic for less of like the structure of a prompt, but more the kind of principles that you need. This is also from a webinar. This is freely available online. It's called Clearer Dialogues with AI, Unpacking Prompt Engineering for Librarians. Would highly recommend watching that. And they show you examples of each of these ones, why being concise is good. Because um, it's especially about that cluttering your prompt with extra detail that might not be so helpful. Remembering to be logical, you know, giving structured information in a, in a format and flow that makes sense. Um, that will give you much better results. Same with explicit, you know, be clear, be specific, and you're going to get clear and specific answers compared to more broad and more generic responses. And then, yeah, remind you to be adaptive and to reflect, be critical, fact check evaluate your responses don't just trust it because you've gotten a response um and then we've got one more slide that i think is just um how to reduce hallucinations and these are um just good reminders yeah try multiple approaches turn the question turn your ai responses into questions so if you get an answer you could say is that quite right or um there was a good example of a of a prompt where it got something wrong is that what's the who's the fastest swimmer across the english channel and it gives you one name but then if you ask, is that person the fastest swim across the English Channel? It says, no, this is, it's actually this other person. So you can, if you get to the same result, regardless of how you frame your question, then you can probably trust that it's got multiple sources that indicate that that's where that's come from. Whereas if you get different responses, then you can see there's conflicting information in the training data. Um, and yeah, I think the final thing is just reminder to keep training, keep looking out for things like this. There's lots of resources out there. There's lots of LinkedIn learning. There's lots of training available. It is a lot of work, but I do think it's quite rewarding. And it's something that the students seem to have a lot of interest in. And we've seen lots of students come to our things because of it's got AI in the title. Um, so I think it's still something that interests students and interests staff. Um, so I think us having a, a place in that, I think is really important and staying in that conversation. Fabulous. Thank you. Una. And just uh, this is a book on my reading list. There is an O'Reilly book on this. And my point around this was really, you know, some of this stuff are for developers, not for librarians. But I still think we should be in this space and taking what we can from kind of things like this, even though it's maybe for different audiences.